tonight for our evening service. Uh, I see looking around, we have the best singers here tonight. So it's really good to, oh, and on Facebook too, there's some really good singers out there too. So we're gonna start uh, with Fairest of All the Earth Beside. singing about tonight then you need to listen to the word of God because the Lord Jesus Christ died to set us free and those of us that know him as our Lord and Savior that's why he's a wonderful man of Calvary and then he'll become your shepherd the Lord's my shepherd Next one, then. Uh, the love of God 
is greater far. a little chorus now his name is wonderful his name is wonderful his name is wonderful Jesus my Lord I wonder if he is your Lord tonight we pray that you'll trust him as your savior if you haven't yet done so Jesus. 
Okay, we're going to have our opening hymn now. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. If you rise after the introduction. Loving God and Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence tonight, we thank you for that man of Calvary. We thank you that he died upon the cross to set us free. Oh, what wonderful, great love is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we thank you that he loved us so much that he gave himself for us. We've been singing about the grace, the mercy, the love. You gave so much for us, our God and our Father, and yet you gave your one and only Son to die in our place. Our Father, we're so thankful that he came. We're th so thankful that he changed our world for those that know him as our Savior tonight. And our prayer is that many more will come to trust him as their Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Our Father, we thank you that we have another opportunity to open up your word, the Bible, which we're so thankful for, and to listen to the words which you've given to Peter tonight. Bless him as he, speak, we, he speaks, we pray. Father, we do think of Christine at home and just pray that you'll continue to give her the recovery that she needs. Our Father, we pray that you 
quickly bring her back to us and that she would have a speedy recovery. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for listening to your word again and for the children's talk. We just press that children's talk again to the young people that were here and those who were listening online. Our Father, we thank you that we can hear your word again tonight. And we just pray that you bless us as we listen to your word and be encouraged by it, helped by it, and challenged by it, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Let me thank Dave for leading the choruses and also opening our meeting this evening. It's really good to be able to get some help sometimes, isn't it? And it's good to have a different voice up here as well. Let me give you a few announcements for the incoming week. Let me welcome you, first of all, into our service this evening. It's good to see each and every one of you out. And we trust that you will know the Lord's blessing as you worship with us here this evening. Let me also welcome those who tune in, tune in online. And we're so pleased that you're listening in with us. And we trust you too will be blessed as you listen into our service at home. Uh, don't forget the praise group will meet this evening after the service and they will be having a practice. Wednesday evening at 8 p.m., our Bible study and prayer meeting, God willing, we'll be finishing our series from Lethargy Awake as we've been going through the book of Malachi and we'll finish off the book then on Wednesday night. Thursday evening, the first day of training will be from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. If you weren't able to make last week, you're very welcome to come along this week um, and it would be good to see a good number out at that first day in training course. We're hoping that two people from each of the works in the church will come along so that we're covered each in each area of the work that two folk have been trained in first aid. So if you can make sure if you're in ahead of one of the areas that made two people um, from whatever you're in charge of come along and are at that first aid training. That takes us round to Friday evening, the 24th of June. June. The church barbecue will be at 7 p.m. If you would like to come along to that and haven't yet signed your name at the back, please do sign your name so that we know who's coming and how many to cater for. Next Lord's Day, Sunday the 26th of June, our prayer meeting in the morning will be at 10.45 a.m. Our morning service and breaking of bread at 11.30 a.m. Our evening services, prayer at 5.45 p.m. And the gospel service at 6.30 p.m. Uh, just a few additional announcements. Remember, for child protection, if you missed the recent child protection evening with David Jackson, please do remember to see Sam Campbell regarding that. Don't forget the wee bags for Ukraine that have been out the back. And also don't forget that the new crash um, rotas were available this morning for the rest of the year. All of these announcements are made subject to the will of the Lord. Now, we've no singer this evening, so we're going to sing again, and we're going to sing our second hymn, In Tenderness He Sought Me, um, Weary and Sick with Sin, and On His Shoulders Brought Me Back to His Fold Again, While Angels in His Presence Sang Until the Courts of Heaven Rang, Oh, the Love That Bought Me. And this is a lovely gospel hymn, and we'll stand and we'll sing after the introduction.
that's good singing this evening. We're turning in our Bibles, please, to the book of 2 Samuel. The book of 2 Samuel, please, in chapter 9. We were just singing of the amazing grace that brought us to the fold. Amazing grace. And that's the theme that we're going to be taking as we turn to Scripture this evening. I would like to speak to you under the title, Amazing Grace at the King's Table. Amazing Grace at the King's Table. And we're turning to 2 Samuel, please, and the chapter 9. And we're going to be reading the whole chapter this evening, just 13 verses, 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we'll begin to read from the verse 1, Amazing Grace at the King's Table. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? There was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness, the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar and the son of Amiel from Lodabar. And when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant? that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land, shall till the land for him. Thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. And so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. And we trust the Lord will bless the reading of his word to each of our hearts this evening. Just a couple of weeks ago as a nation, we celebrated the queen's Platinum Jubilee, celebrating 70 years of Queen Elizabeth II. And she was proclaimed queen in the year 1952 at the age of 25. And then uh, that came after the sudden death of her father, King George VI. And her official coronation took place the following year on the 2nd of June, 1953. It was the first ever televised coronation And it was watched at the time by a record 27 million people in the UK alone. She is the longest living and reigning monarch in British history. And although she never went to university, and she never went to have an education like that, she has been the advisor and confidant to 14 prime ministers. She's a remarkable lady. And it's been a remarkable reign for 70 years. 70 years is a long time to sit on the throne. 
to reign over the commonwealth. And just a couple of weekends ago, so much was said about our queen. We heard about the queen and her fame. We heard about her fame. She was certainly one of the best known, she certainly is one of the best known people in the world. We heard about the queen and her fortune. She indeed is one of the richest individuals in our land. We could think of the Queen and her fans. She is immensely popular and remains a much-loved Queen. We saw this, of course, as we witnessed the crowds a couple of weekends ago gathered to celebrate at Horse Guards Parade. There's the Queen and her fidelity, her devotion to duty. She has served her country and she has performed her role exceptionally well. There was talk a couple of weeks ago as we watched the TV programs of the Queen and her family, her children, her grandchildren. I wondered, did you know, I count a dog as a family member. And I wondered, did you know, she employs 1,200 people, yet she prefers to feed her own dogs. I learned that when reading things about her. We can think of her family. We can think of the Queen and her future. Will she abdicate? Will she step down and hand over the throne? We hope not. But of course, all of these things, they are important subjects that we considered a couple of weeks ago as we celebrated 70 years of Her Majesty the Queen. But I want to consider another thing that we hear about our Queen, and it's the Queen and her faith. You see, we've just celebrated the 70th year of Her Majesty's reign, but she often speaks of her faith in the ever-reigning King of Kings. And she certainly acknowledges a belief in God, and that is the one, she often says, whom she draws her strength from. And in our passage this evening, we've read about another monarch, and his name was King David. He's one of the most famous kings in the Bible. In the passage, we've read of how he shows amazing kindness, and amazing grace to someone who doesn't deserve it. And it paints a wonderful picture of what the King of Kings can do for you. The story is told of a man called Lagardia, who when he was the mayor of New York, a city, it was during the worst days of the Great Depression and then on into World War II. And he was called by adoring New Yorkers, the little flower because he only was five foot four, and he always wore a carnation in his lapel. And he was known for his kindness. He, he would take entire orphanages to baseball games. And whenever the New York newspapers were on strike, he would go onto the radio and he would read children's stories to the children. And one bitterly cold night in January of 1935, the mayor turned up at a night court that served some of the poorest people in the, country, in the city. And he dismissed the mayor, he dismissed the judge for the evening, and he took over the bench himself. And within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him, and she was charged with stealing a loaf of bread. And she told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted her, and her daughter was very ill. And her two grandchildren were starving. But the shopkeeper from whom the bread had been stolen, he refused to drop his charges. And the shopkeeper said to the mayor, he said, it's a real bad neighborhood here, your honor. And she's got to be punished to teach other people around here a lesson. This can't go on. And the guardian sighed. He turned to the woman and he said, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. It's $10 or it's 10 days in jail. But even as he pronounced the sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his pocket. And he extracted a $10 note. And he tossed it into his hat saying, here's the $10 fine, which I now remit. And he went on and he said, furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone in this courtroom 50 cents. For living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that their grandchildren can eat. And he turned and he fined each person in the courtroom 50 cents. 
The next morning, the New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 had been turned over to a bewildered old lady who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. There's a story about a lady who didn't deserve the mayor's grace. But not only did he repay her debt, but he ensured that she was given so much more. And the passage that we have read together this evening in God's precious Word, it provides for us one of the clearest pictures of amazing grace that you will find in the Word of God. God uses King David as a living illustration of what grace is all about. And that's why our title this evening is Amazing Grace at the King's Table. I just want you to know two things from this passage this evening. Just two things to take away this Sunday evening. And the first thing I want you to note is the amazing grace that is extended by the King. Amazing grace extended by the King. Read with me 2 Samuel here, 9, and the verse 1. It says this, and it's the King David, he's asking this, and it says, David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? King David says that he wants to show kindness for Jonathan's sake. The word kindness here can be translated as goodness or mercy or favor or loving kindness. It's an Old Testament equivalent to the word that we find in the New Testament, grace. And grace, it's often defined as the unmerited love and favor of God towards someone who is undeserving. Grace is one person accepting another in spite of the unworthiness of the other person to be accepted. And David, he desires to extend grace to a member of Saul's family. Saul had been the previous king who throughout his reign had actually sought to kill David. And it's amazing that David would want to show grace to the family of Saul. In those days when a new king would have come to power, he usually destroyed every member of the former king's household in an effort to prevent a rebellion from the former king's family. And King David, he would have had the right to execute judgment. He would have had the right to get rid of Saul's family. But instead, he chose to demonstrate grace instead. And David did this, not because the house of Saul deserved it, but because of his relationship with Jonathan, Saul's son. And there are two promises that he had made. David had promised both Jonathan and Saul that he wouldn't totally destroy their offspring. And so this grace was extended. Here really was a family that deserved to be destroyed. Destroyed by the new king, but instead he wanted to extend kindness. You know, when I think about our queen, I'm sure that there's been many times that Queen Elizabeth has had to exercise a great amount of grace. We could think of the many times that prime ministers have made public examples of themselves. They've had to stand before the queen each week at audience and discuss the affairs of the country. And I'm sure the queen at times has had to show grace to those prime ministers. But tonight, as we think about the graciousness of David, which was extended to a family who were undeserving, it reminds me of how you and I are undeserving of God's grace. Undeserving. Every single one of us, preacher included, we have offended a holy God. And the Lord would have a right to cast us off whenever He wanted. That The Lord has a right to destroy us completely because we have disobeyed His word. We've offended a holy God. And the Lord would have been right at the very moment that Adam sinned, right at the very start, when Adam and Eve disobeyed, the Lord would have had the right to destroy everything right there and then and be done with the human race. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. What we deserve for offending a holy God, it's a life sentence. It's death. 
But instead of immediately being punished for our sin, what does God do? He has shown us great mercy. He shows us great kindness. And we are shown amazing grace. We could have been thrown into hell without a second thought. And God would have been right to do so. But rather, Peter in the New Testament tells us that the Lord is long-suffering to us word not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. My dear unconverted friend tonight, I want you to see that you and I deserve to die in our sin. But instead, the Son of God, the King of kings, took your place, took our place, took our punishment at the place called Calvary. You know, the Lord Jesus, the ever-reigning king. He loves all people. He loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. And when we look at this verse that we've just read from Peter, Peter says to you, when he speaks of the Lord, he says he's not willing that you should perish. That's why God sent his only begotten son, That's why God sent him into the world to die for you so that you didn't have to perish, but that you can come in repentance and bow the knee, that you can be saved from your sin and your guilt. You can be saved and you can be made fit for eternity. You can be made ready for heaven. I don't know how anyone lives this life without Christ. I don't know how you go through this life without a Savior. When things get tough, when that person passes on, I don't know how you get through it. I couldn't get through this life without the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And he died to save you from the wrath and the punishment of hell. Imagine someone loving you so much that they went to die for you, to save you from eternal punishment and to reject it. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Please get this fact into your head tonight. God loves you. And he wants you not ever to go to a lost eternity. And so he sent his son to display that wonderful love. What amazing grace is extended to you tonight. I wonder, will you accept that amazing grace? How much does the Lord love you? Well, let me tell you what his reply would be. It would be this much. This is what happened to him. The people took him one day and they stripped his clothes off him and they whipped him with a Roman whip which tore his back open. And they put a purple robe on him and they mocked him. And they beat a crown of thorns into his brow. They struck him with their hands. They spat in his face. They plucked the hairs from his face. They put a reed in his right hand and they mockingly bowed down to him and they called out, Heal, King of the Jews. They led him through the streets of Jerusalem as a public spectacle. And up Mount Calvary he went. They took him and they kneeled his hands and his feet to a wooden cross. And above the cross, the accusation read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Normally, a criminal's crimes were written above the heads. But the Lord Jesus, he was sinless. And the ever-reigning king, the king of kings, suffered in your place. He bled and he died. And he bore the wrath of God that you deserved. He suffered for our sins to bring us back to God. This was all in God's plan. The Lord Jesus died so that you might be freed from the guilt of sin, free from sin itself, in order to make you fit for heaven. Does that not say, I love you? And he died for people that have completely offended him. That's amazing grace, shown by the King of kings. The Lord Jesus died so that God could make you part of his royal family. And he's in heaven today. 
And he sits at the right hand of the Father on high. And this evening, the Lord Jesus wants you to be born again into his family. In other words, he wants you to make a fresh start with him as your Savior. The Lord Jesus died for you to save you from potential disaster and so that you could be part of his family. You are so unworthy. I am so unworthy of that. Yet he died for you. You know, David, he sent out his servant to look for the remaining members of Saul's family. And tonight I want to tell you that the Savior is searching for you. And he's calling to you to come and join his family. I wonder, will you listen? I want you to notice a very important word in our passage this evening. It says this. When, he's, when David asks his question, he says this in the first verse. Is there yet any that is left in the house of Saul? He wasn't looking for one particular person. He wanted to know if there was any. He wanted to know how many there were. King David placed no limits on his grace. He was willing to extend his grace to any member of the family of Saul. And praise God tonight, when it comes to you and I, as we stand before the King of Kings, he offers his grace to whosoever will. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means you. God's grace is extended to every man, woman, boy, and girl that walks the face of this planet tonight. And God's grace is offered to you. I wonder, do you feel that the things you have done in this life are too bad? Maybe you feel that you're undeserving of God's amazing grace. Maybe you feel the things you've done are just too bad. And maybe you're just wrapped up in guilt because of something that you've done. Well, God in his grace is able to free you from that guilt tonight. He can free you from the chains of your sin and make you fit for heaven and fit for home. And this offer goes to you tonight. It's amazing grace for all. Amazing grace was extended by the king. But I want you to see, secondly, that the amazing grace was embraced by Mephibosheth. You see, it's all good knowing. All good knowing that amazing grace has been extended to you. It's even all good knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary to die for you and has shown his love for you, but it requires a response. It requires you to accept this free gift that he offers you. And Mephibosheth, he came. The picture is painted of Mephibosheth. that It's a hopeless picture. His father had been killed in battle. He had been lame since he was just five years old, and he lived in a place called Lodibar. Do you know what Lodibar means? It means no pasture. He lived in a barren place. And a hopeless picture is painted here of Mephibosheth. And all of a sudden, he's before a king. And he fell before the king in his face. And look at verse 6. It says, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of David, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold my servant. And Mephibosheth, he's brought before the king and he humbles himself. He realizes he's not worthy to stand before the king. And let me tell you tonight, David, he turned and he knew Mephibosheth's name. Do you see, he named him. He said, Mephibosheth. And let me tell you, the Lord knows your name tonight. In fact, he knows all about you. There's no secrets with the Lord. And tonight he wants you to enter into a personal relationship with him. He wants to be a friend to you that sticks closer than a brother. And he offers you the riches of his amazing grace. And he wants you to embrace that grace. He wants you to accept his free gift of salvation. You know, if you do that, he'll be with you through the trials of this life. If only you would humbly bow before him and admit your great need of him. You know, King David, he speaks peace to Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth, he would become part of David's family. And and he would be protected by the king. And God, he wants you to become part of his royal family this evening. And yet there's so many, when they listen to this message, they reject the message. 
Or maybe you just think it's not for you and you walk out the door or maybe you listen online and you turn your computer off and that's that. That was a lovely message. That's not what it's about. God requires an answer from you tonight. I wonder, will you accept Christ as your Savior? I wonder, will you accept this grace? Many people tonight reject the Lord Jesus Christ as their King. They refuse His word. Then they'll not come to Him They have no time for God. They have no love for God and the King of Kings. They won't receive Him. They seek honor from men rather than God, and they won't listen to the Word of God. And yet one day, my friend, you will stand before God, and your only plea to get into heaven will be the Lord Jesus Christ, but it'll be too late if you didn't prepare in this life. Imagine hearing God's invite to be part of His eternal kingdom, part of his kingdom, and rejecting him. Imagine listening to God's word being proclaimed so clearly week after week from this pulpit and just ignoring it. David also promised to give Mephibosheth a place at the king's table. And it was with a happy heart that Mephibosheth, he embraces these treasures of grace that David offered him. And you're invited to come to the king's table tonight, not just any king's table. The king of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who is the great creator of all things. And the Lord has paid a great price for your sin and he invites you to his banqueting table. And he says to you, come. For all things are now ready. He went to the cross and died for you. Actually took the punishment for you. And now says to you simply, come. You're invited. I can save you from punishment. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, for all things are now ready. He just says, come. He can offer you protection from the disappointments of this life. He's a constant friend. He's the only one who will faithfully stand with you in this life and faithfully stand for you in eternity. When you think over these past number of years of turmoil and unrest and confusion and all that's been going on, we can think of coronavirus. We can think of the war in Ukraine. Surely it's caused you to stop and think, what is this life all about? Will you not turn to the Lord Jesus Christ tonight? You not seek him for salvation. Here's the problem. If you continue to reject the Lord, one day he'll have to say to you, depart from me. I never knew you. You who worked in equity. Come to him tonight. If you want respite from the way your life is, if you need a place of refuge, come to him without delay. Place your life in his hands. He loves you. And he weeps over you. And he gave his life for you. Will you not embrace that amazing grace tonight? We don't deserve it. Yet tonight once more you hear that the king of kings extends his hand of grace to you. There's a lady called Julia Johnston who penned a great hymn that sums up the passage that we read in God's Word tonight. I want to read the first verse and chorus of that to you. This is what it says. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. The King of Kings is calling you in his grace tonight. I wonder, can you hear his voice? Let me tell you something. See if God is speaking to you tonight. See if in the stillness of the meeting, if God has been challenging you, if the Spirit of God has been convicting you, 
Let me plead with you, don't harden your heart to that. In God's word, it says today, if ye shall hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Tonight, the Spirit may be striving with you. What if the Spirit of God would strive no longer with you? Accept his grace. Accept Christ as your Savior tonight and start for heaven and for home. Our closing hymn this evening is a challenging one and one that I want you to really think about as we sing together. And the words are this. It says, Is there a heart that is waiting, longing for pardon today? Hear the glad message proclaiming Jesus is passing this way. Jesus is passing this way tonight. You've heard his word. And he is here and just right where you are. You don't need anybody to sit with you. You can trust Christ as your Savior right where you are. Maybe in the pew in the church. Maybe sitting at home wherever you're listening. Right where you are. You could trust Christ as Savior. Really listen and think about the words of this hymn. And we'll stand and we'll sing and we'll remain standing as we close our service this evening. Our Father, we thank you this evening for the amazing grace that you have extended to us. Father, you are so merciful and kind to us. You are so patient with us, long-suffering. And Father, we realize that we, you sent your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to this earth. And he went to the cross of Calvary. And there he died in our place. And Father, we thank you that he is a risen Savior and that, Father, he is willing to save today. 
And Father, I pray if there's anyone who has listened to the gospel proclaimed tonight, as they have listened to your word, and Father, if they're outside of Christ, may they not reject your word once more. But Father, we pray that they will respond and come to know Christ as Savior. Father, if your spirit is working in someone's heart tonight, Father, I pray that indeed that they will come and trust Christ as Savior. Father, we thank you that right up and down our land that there have been many meetings just like this one. And the gospel is being proclaimed tonight. And Father, we pray that wherever your word is being proclaimed faithfully, that Father, indeed, there will be great signs following the preaching. May this be a great day for your kingdom here in Northern Ireland. And Father, we pray that your spirit will sweep across our country this night. Father, we pray this for your glory. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of this, the Lord's day. We thank you, Father, that we have been in this place and we have heard your word today. We thank you for time spent around the table remembering our Savior. We thank you, Father, that as we've been in this place today, we have had enjoyed fellowship with your people and fellowship with our great God. And Father, we pray as we go home now, that while, yes, there's a lovely presence of our God here with his people, we thank you for those of us who know you as Savior, that you have promised to go with us, and you, you will never leave us nor forsake us. So, Father, we thank you that as we go into another week, with whatever burdens and trials are there, that, Father, you're there with each of your children, and, Father, you will bless each one of us. Father, take us now to our homes in safety, we pray. We pray this in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.